Good morning. So good to see all of you here. Before we sing our first song, there's a word in that song that I want to talk about. It won't take more than 15 minutes, so don't worry. There's a word in the second verse of this song that says, take to arm you for the, for the fight, the panoply of God. Anybody out there wants to jump up and say, oh, I know what panoply means. Over the time that Pastor Dave has been with us, over and again, and again he has emphasized knowing what words mean. So I looked up this word panoply. I googled it. And the first thing I found was it's some kind of a computer program. Hmm. So now you all know what this song is about, right? No. I had to scroll and scroll and scroll till they quit talking about computer programs. And I found Merriam Webster. You all know Merriam, don't you? Wonderful. <laughs> and the definition of panoply emphasizes a complete spread, covers everything. If you've got the panoply of God, you don't need anything else. So now that word means something to me anyway. I like how the hymn book, this hymn book that we use is laid out. And since we don't use the hymn books out there, we don't see at the tops of the pages, a theme is, is always at the top of the page. And for this first song at the top of the page, it's among several hymns that talk about spiritual conflict and victory. And this first song is telling us that as we go out in the conflict, we need to have the panoply of God. Everything that he has to provide to protect us. Specifically, panoply is used to refer to armor. And in this page I found on, in Google, there was a picture of these armors where everything is covered. This is all you can see of this person. So that's the idea. So I invite you to stand and sing Soldiers of Christ Arise, 723.
we are again this morning, Father. We have gathered to encourage one another, to catch up on news with one another. We have gathered to increase our learning of who you are, and we have gathered to express back to you what we have been learning over the years of who you are and sing it back to you in praise, honoring you and glorifying you. We are so grateful we could come together today. And we pray that we will again today learn more of who you are and who we are in Christ Jesus. For your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our next song is 727, Faith is the Victory. The words for this song were written in 1882 by a man named John Yates. He started out in his career life selling shoes. And then he went on to manage a hardware store. And then he went on to edit a local newspaper. The first line in this song says, Encamped along the hills of light, you Christian soldiers rise. Encamped along the hills of light. What did John Yates know about camping among the hills of light? I don't know. You might want to dig that out when you get home. So let's sing it.
isn't a cheerleader's song, I have never seen one. Let's share with one another. Good morning again, and um, we do welcome you to Hillman this morning. Glad to be here to worship the Lord. Um, just want to mention a couple things. Um, February 18th, um, if you're on the Board of Stewards, we'll have a meeting February 18th um, following church. And since it's, I uh, can't promise that this will be a short one, we're probably going to chat about having a light lunch or something um, so that we can um, take care of some business. And then um, the, our uh, next business meeting, annual meeting, will be sometime the end of March. We'll nail down an exact date this week. Um, so that is coming up in the future. Um, John and Sarah Nutt wanted uh, me to remind you that they have um, some beef to gift. Um, those of you who could use some um, excellent ground beef. Um, they have it as you uh, downstairs before you go out, so make sure if you can use some to, um, to um, grab some from them. Um, then I just want to throw out um, we have not had a um, uh, official youth leader for a while in our church and we've tried off and on, Delina and I have tried to pull some things together 
and stuff, but we don't have, um, our schedule doesn't allow us to do it every week. Um, and so I'm just kind of uh, throwing this out, thought process. Um, if you um, uh, are willing to uh, host a youth event at your home or if a husband wife team are willing to host something here at the church, um, just start thinking about that, um, praying about that. And um, we talked to myself or Deline, and um, we would just like to try to get a little more regular um, activities for our youth group. Um, so, first of all, pray about it, and uh, let's see what we can do to um, figure something out there. Um, then I just uh, just had a thought. Um, I have no idea what Pastor Dave, well, I have a little idea the title of his sermon, but what he's going to be speaking about and the theme of these songs and the picture that was up there for the first, I believe, the f I can't remember, my, I'm, I turned 58, so um, I can't remember from one minute to the next, but I do know that there was an image of a castle um, for one of the hymns, and the hillside, nice, manicured, um, so that you could see the enemies coming for, from a long way. And it reminded me of um, <clears throat> a picture that God has brought to my mind several times in my life. But um, years ago, we read, uh, I read to our kids um, a book series. One of them I know was called The Silver Trumpet. And uh, it's an allegory kind of on the same line of Pilgrim's Progress. Um, and that image brought back to my mind how um, the Christians, those who were following their Lord, their king, um, their, it was their duty to maintain the castle, to keep their armor um, polished and their armor on and their weapons close, and to keep the landscape around the castle, um, to keep the grass cut down and keep the brush cleared away so that the enemy would not have a place to um, hide and to sneak close to the castle. And in one part of the story, um, the soldiers, the Christians, got lazy, and it was too much work to wear their armor all the time, too cumbersome. Um, so some of them would get in the practice of leaving their armor off, not taking care of it, not keeping their weapons close by, and allowing... Uh, being too lazy, it's too much work to go out to keep the landscape cleared, to keep the brush cut down. And it was fine for a long time, but over time, eventually, the enemy had a place to creep and to get close um, to the castle. And um, because they could get close and because the um, king's soldiers were not prepared by leaving their stuff fleeing around and not being armored, armored up um, that eventually the enemy attacked and many were wounded and some were taken away um, and that image has yeah, stuck in my head and this just kind of like boom brought it back to me how easy it is in our lives as Christians to enjoy Christian fellowship um, we desire to come together and worship on Sunday morning and um, we have good intentions of having a better Bible reading plan for ourselves and um, of having a time of prayer, and, but it becomes cumbersome, right? Uh, I'm speaking personally. It becomes work. I mean, after all, we have a family to raise. We have a job to go to. We have vehicles that break down. We have a home. Things go bad that we have to maintain. And our Christian life becomes cumbersome sometimes, right? Yeah. Well, do I, do I fix this window or, you know, and then I, oh, I'm too tired. I don't have time to pick up my Bible. I don't have time to have my normal prayer time, um, et cetera. And we let the weeds grow up. We let the brush grow up. We set aside our armor because it's hard work sometimes keeping a close relationship with our Lord, right? 
It's not meant to be sit on the couch and, and have everything we want. Um, so it just really spoke to my uh, heart this morning. I can't wait to hear how God uses the message to reinforce um, what he's already speaking to me about through our songs and um, even through that image that just reminded me of that, how we need to keep covered in our armor. We need the whole armor of God. There's a reason it says to stand firm with the whole armor of God. And, um, and we're warned about our enemy. We know who he is, and we know um, how crafty and deceitful he is. So there's sermon number one, and we'll look forward to later. Let's go ahead and have our ushers come forward. We'll take our morning off. Father, thank you. We just want to thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship freely. We thank you for what a great blessing it is to come directly to you, to bring our burdens, to bring our cares, worries, but also to bring our thanks. Thank you for um, taking care of us day to day. Thank you that um, some days um, we just feel empowered and we feel your joy. And other days are really difficult and hard for us. But we thank you that we can trust, that we know, that we can have faith, that you are there through these struggles as well. We just praise you for all you do for us. Praise you for how you provide. And we ask you to bless these offerings this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. speeches or, or uh, preaching for me this morning. I'm just going to sing with you. I just pray that our song and our worship is a sweet and pleasing song to the Lord this morning. Why don't you stand and worship with me?
know you hear from children when they know they don't have to listen to me. <laughs> I don't know if you recognize that place or not. Okay, that's Gooseberry Falls. Uh, that is not my family. I had to borrow a picture. Uh, back when we took our children to Gooseberry Falls, uh, cell phones had not been invented yet, and so therefore you could not capture every moment, so we simply tried to enjoy the moment and all that. Shortly after we moved to Rush City in 98 and began our ministry there, uh, I realized that our family had really never explored uh, the North Shore before, and so uh, we decided to go up there, and so my kids, uh, we were joined by my brother and his four kids, so there were uh, eight young kids, probably ranging in age from probably middle elementary down to even younger than that. So we were up there, so one day we went to uh, Gooseberry Falls, and uh, the kids were kind of down by the water playing and kind of splashing around. And so uh, my Karen and I and my brother and his wife were kind of looking at the kids playing around, and we could see that they were getting a little bit more and more rambunctious. And we began to ask, okay, which one of the eight kids is going to fall in the water first? And so we're kind of speculating. And we all concluded, all eight of us concluded that my brother's son, Lance, he was most likely, you know, there's every kid, you got every kid in the family, something's going to happen to them, and we just assumed it was going to be Lance. And so we kept letting him go on and on, and they started taking more and more risks. And the next thing you know, Lance fell right in the water. And when he hit the water, based upon our speculation, the four adults started laughing. When he looked up and he saw us laughing at him, he became very angry. And I remember he began to lecture his parents you should have warned me I could fall in the water. Well, that story reminded me, as I was working on the text for today out of the James, the same idea came along that when we fall into sin, we tend to blame somebody else. Well, you should have warned me that was going to happen. And so I always think of my nephew, Lance. He liked to, uh, he liked to give lectures, even as a young boy. And uh, so that was fun. So I want to introduce you to a passage today as we are working our way through the opening chapter of James. And so James, uh, he goes on, he's going he's he's to pick, pick up some of the same themes he began the letter with, and uh, we're going to kind of see the connection and see the shifting in his thoughts. So James says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he'll receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. If you've been with us from the beginning of the sermons in the book of James, you'll notice that there are a number of themes that James began the letter with, that he's going to come back to and he's going to develop in our section today as well. And there are three themes in this section that he actually began the letter with. I just want to call your attention to the first theme is the idea of remaining steadfast. James had said in the opening that one of the reasons that God allows or brings trials into our lives, he's trying to produce a couple of qualities, and one of the qualities is steadfastness. And I had introduced to you a definition that I heard that I really liked, and he, one of the authors defines steadfastness as a long obedience in the same direction. And I still like that. And so what James is saying is that one of the things that God is trying to do in our lives, we obeyed God when we responded in salvation. What God wants, he wants that continued, he wants that long obedience throughout our lives in the same direction. That's one of the reasons why God allows trials. The second theme that we have seen through this as well is the idea of trials, okay? Now, in the opening frame, the Greek word that, that James used there, it can be translated one of two ways depending on the context. It can be translated testines. It also can be translated as trials. It depends on the context. I think in the opening context, the, the translation of the idea of trials is that, you know, you know, it talks about, you know, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. And so he's simply talking about those trials that come a part of one living in a fallen world and living in a world that's antagonistic. And so that's one translation. I think now he's shifting now to the second, which is the idea of temptation, okay? Now we know that lots of times trials can result in temptation. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. 
And then the third thing that we're going to talk about the idea of is withstanding. One of the goals that God has as he allows trials in our lives, he's trying to prove something. And what he's trying to prove, he's trying to uh, prove the genuineness of our faith. And the only way that faith can really be true, you know, tried and proved genuine is to go through trials. So with that in mind, let us notice this transition now. Again, let's remind ourselves of the opening context. James is writing to Jewish believers who had to flee Jerusalem because of persecution. So they trusted in Christ. Persecution arose. We can read about that in the opening chapters of Acts. And so because of that persecution, they have now fled Jerusalem, and now they're living out in the pagan, what's called the dispersion, okay? Because they had to leave, they probably left everything behind. So now they're starting out in a world that's antagonistic to them. It's a world that's foreign to them. Having lived in Jerusalem, now they're living in the Roman world with all the paganism. Also financially, they're in difficult straits. Also probably they're experiencing the same ostracization as well. And so let's say that now you fled Jerusalem because of that, because of your faith in Christ, but now life hasn't gotten any better. There are times that when that happens in a believer's life and the problem persists, eventually the believer can begin to turn against God and begin to blame God for the situation that they are in. And I think that this may be the situation that James is writing when he comes to our passage as well. I think that James is concerned about their attitude as their problems persist. Years ago, I was introduced to an author by the name of Philip Yancey. I really like him. Uh, Philip Yancey is a very thoughtful uh, Christian author, and he handles difficult subjects. He never writes on anything that's easy. He writes on difficult. The first book I read of him was called Disappointment with God. And the reason why the book came about, um, he was contacted by a young doctoral student. This young man had been saved at a later period of life. He felt called to the ministry. He had gone to seminary. Um, he went on to higher education. And so he had, write, he had written a paper for his doctoral program, a long thesis, on the book of Job as he wrestled with the problem of evil in the world and did God allow it? How did Job react to that as well? And so this young man had written this uh, paper, and it had been a very good paper, and so his professors had encouraged him to take this technical work and turn it into a book. And so he had written to Philip Yancey because Philip Yancey was a recognized author who handled a lot of this as well. He had asked Philip Yancey if he would write the foreword to the book when it came out. And so Philip Yancey got to know the young man. He began to write this short foreword that would you know, introduce the book as well. By the time the book was going to be published, a number of things had happened in this young man's life that had turned him against God. What had happened is a, number, a series of things. What had happened is that um, his folks had always had a difficult marriage. They ended up getting divorced, even though he had prayed that his folks would not get divorced. Also in this process, he had lost a job, and he was now unemployed. And in that stat, uh, he was also engaged as well and his fiance broke it off. And so he had a series of traumatic situations in his life. And again, as he began to look at this, okay, here I'm a child of God, here I'm trying to go in the ministry, and then every prayer I've asked, I've gotten the wrong answer. He turned so bitter against God that he decided that he wasn't gonna publish the book after all. In fact, on a dramatic night, he actually went up to his library. He took his library down into the backyard of where he was staying, and in a fire pit, he burned every theological work that he had bought all the years going to seminary. And so when Philip Yancey heard that sad story, he was motivated to write his own version of the book of Job. And that's where this book came about, Disappointment with God. If you've never read it before, I would encourage you to read it. And so I think this is the scenario, I think, that we're looking at here as well. So what James is doing, he's writing to believers who are suffering for their faith. And the suffering apparently has persisted. It has a financial impact as well. We looked at that last week when he talked about their attitude about money and things like that as well. And so for a series of things, I think James is concerned that these people might be tempted in the midst of their trials to become angry and begin to blame God for their trials. And so what I want to do, I think the outline is pretty simple. And it's simply, I think he's going to talk about, he wants to talk about what is the nature of testing. 
Then he wants to remind them of the nature of God, and then he wants to remind them of their own nature. And so that'll be our approach as we go through this as well. And so look at the opening one. Look at this opening phrase. So he begins, again, uh, in, I think it's verse 9. So he says, blessed is the man. He used the generic Greek word, uh, aner. Blessed is the person. Blessed is the believer, male or female, who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he'll receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Now, if you've read your Bible, you're familiar with this idea of being blessed, okay? We think of the Beatitudes, okay? This concept of being blessed, it describes the blessed person, it describes the happy person, it describes the individual who is enjoying God's special favor. In fact, we have a number of well-known ones as well. And so I want you to look at, uh, this is how the, the Psalms begins with a, uh, a Psalm of wisdom. He says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That's kind of a positive approach to the Beatitudes, but think about James' older brother Jesus. He also had his Beatitudes, but they're not as warm and fuzzy as we want them to be. What does Jesus say? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, I don't want to be poor in spirit. That doesn't sound good to me. I want to be happy. But he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. Again, I don't want to mourn. But he says, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Well, I want to be pushed over, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And so this concept of the blessed life, the happy life, it comes from the Old Testament. And so let's talk about what, uh, where this comes from. There are several elements that go into this beatitude or the blessed life. The first one is the concept of being blessed. Again, what James is saying is that God is the source of the blessing. James writes, God has promised to bless those believers who love him. And the definition is you show you love God by what? Not by feeling all warm and fuzzy about God. No, you do it by obeying him. James is very clear about that. And that is, is that um, God, the, the idea of saying, well, I love God. Again, that's a warm and fuzzy. That doesn't mean anything. God says you're going to show me you love me by obeying me. And that's what I'm looking for. And I'm looking for that into this particular trial as well. The second thought is, is that there is kind of an eschatological orientation to the blessing. Eschatological is the big fancy word for end time stuff. The ultimate realization of this blessed life is what? It's the end times. It's, so James, it may not be in this life, but I guarantee it will come in the life to come. And we know there's an end time. Why? Because what are you going to receive? You're going to receive the crown of life. And we're going to define that in just a little bit. Third, there is the notion of a reversal of fortune that will be experienced by the obedient believer who passed the test. So you remain steadfast in this trial. If you remain steadfast, there will be a reversal of fortune. But you've got to trust God that that's going to happen. Then the fourth thing is the experience of blessing is conditional in that the individual needs to love God and live faithfully as well. Now James was an observant Jew. What prayer would every observant Jew recite every single day of his life? It was out of the book of Deuteronomy. If you were an observant Jew, every day of your life you would say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And that's what James is getting at. So James says, I want to talk about the nature of trials. The nature of trials it will result in the blessing from God if you show God you love him by being obedient. So let's use a test case of a contemporary of James. Think about Peter. Peter was the kind of the outspoken leader of the disciples. As they were making their way to Jerusalem where Jesus was going to be killed, Jesus began to tell the disciples that we're going to go to Jerusalem I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be handed over to the rulers, and they are going to kill me. And Peter, very outspokenly, denounced Jesus and said, Stop talking that way. You're discouraging the troops. And Jesus rebuked him by calling him Satan, my adversary, and get behind me. 
As they went through that week, Jesus came to Peter and he told Peter, Satan has desired you that he may sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. Now we know at the Last uh, Supper, Peter very boldly said, Now they all might deny you, but I never will. And we all know what happened to Peter. So what happened? He faced a trial in his life and he caved. He denied the Lord three times. So what did Jesus do? After the resurrection, he found Peter out, and he asked him those three searching questions. Peter, do you love me? One for every denial around the fire. And so God had to do that. So in a loving way, God, Jesus had to, in a sense, beat Peter down so he could use him. If Peter had never gone through it, he would never be the leader that we see in the early church. And so what James is getting at, God uses trials in our lives not to destroy us, but to build us back up so that we can be useful. In fact, think about this. This is something that Peter said as he wrote later on, as he looked back in life. He's writing to all the Christians, now this is what I've learned. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, same word James is using, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice all the elements of the blessing. It requires trials. You can't have blessing without trials. And what are the goal of the trials? The goal of the trials is to prove the genuineness of your faith. And when are you going to ultimately realize that? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what James is saying, it may not happen in your lifetime. But this is where your faith has to kick in. You've got to trust God that he is going to provide that. So let's get back to James's thought. What does James promise for those who persist? You're going to get the crown of life. So what is the crown of life? A lot of people have kind of speculated that there are actually going to be physical crowns that God is going to hand out in heaven. If you think about the logic of it all, if you're in heaven and the streets are paved with gold, what do you need a crown for? And so I think there's a better way to think about that. The Greek word that James uses is the Greek word stephanos. In his day, it was used to describe they had athletes back then. They had the Greek games. And when you won a race or some contest, you were given a laurel wreath that sat on your head. Okay, That's the same Greek word that James is using here. But what happens to laurel wreaths after a while? What happens to those lovely wreaths you hang on your door around Christmas time? You eventually throw it out, right? And so when James talks about a crown of life, there's two ways to view it. It could be a descriptive genitive, which describes simply it's a living crown as opposed to a perishable crown. Probably the better way to look at that is James is talking about the crown which is life. I think he's simply talking about the reward is not going to be a physical crown. I think the reward is simply going to be eternal life. The reason why I say that is because look at this passage out of the book of Revelation. John writes, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you'll have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. I would say this. When you and I get to the afterlife, we're not going to want any trappings anyway. All we're going to want is what? Eternal life. That's going to be enough for us. So I think James is defined, what is the nature of testing? The nature of testing is that God is trying to produce steadfastness in our lives, and that's where he gets. So now he moves so on, on to, to the, the next part. part. This is, let's talk about the nature of God. Again, I think James is concerned that some of his contemporaries, as they live out there, are starting to become resentful because their situation has persisted. So James says, okay, let's talk about God. So he writes, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. Why would he say that? Because I think he's hearing that. I think he's hearing those rumors maybe in letters coming back that some people are starting to get bitter. They're starting to turn. So James says, let no one be tempted. Who is tempted to say, I am tempted by God? For two reasons. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. And so it appears that James' statement here is that some believers are beginning to call God's goodness into question. Now, that's actually the norm. Think about the very first story in the Bible. 
God places Adam and Eve into a garden. He gives them everything they could imagine. He just puts one restriction on them. There's one tree you cannot have. And so what happened? Satan came and he began to whisper, oh God, he, you know, he's, he's withholding something from you. He's not being fair to you. That same thought is going on as well. And so I think that James is concerned about that, that that's what some of those people are thinking and they're beginning to turn. We see that all the way through the Old Testament. Think of the nation of Israel. In a very dramatic way, God sends Moses down into Egypt. They have those 10 big plagues. They destroy basically the nation of Egypt. They come out with great triumph and they're at Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, God calls Moses up to talk to him. Moses is gone for 40 days. What does Israel do? We don't know what happened to Moses. Uh, Aaron, uh, we need a new leader here. So what does Aaron say? Well, give me all your gold. And the Bible says he fashioned a golden calf. It only took them 40 days to begin to blame God for his absence. Well, let's jump forward a little bit. Now they're in the conquest, okay? And so God is telling the nation of Israel as they make their way to the promised land that I'm going to give you this wonderful land. And so what does Moses do? He chooses one man from each tribe. He tells them to go and search out the whole land. So 12 of the guys take time, and they go through the whole length of the land. And they come back, and 10 of the guys said, yeah, the land's exactly the way you described it, but there's these giant people who live in the land. And if you've been in adult Sunday school, you know who those giant people were. And they said, you know what? Uh, God has brought us here. He's going to destroy us. Now, two of the guys, Joshua and Caleb, said, no, God can actually do that. And so what happened? The people actually turned and they were actually going to kill Moses and choose a new leader. And God's punishment was not. So what happens? It's human nature. When you get into a tight spot and it persists longer than you think it should, the tendency is to turn against God and blame God for your problems. And so James wants to talk about the nature of testing. Look at this passage that uh, Paul writes. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. When I was a young pastor, I had a young single man in my church, and uh, he desired to be married, but he was excessively shy. And so I remember that um, we were very close. I was in Wasika, and so Pillsbury College. And so a number of young ladies who went to Pillsbury came over. So uh, I don't believe in this. I don't believe in dating evangelism. I'm just not going to get into that. But some of the women in the church began to set him up for some days, and they just didn't go well. He was just so quiet. Well, he worked at a place, and he had developed a really good friendship with a lady who worked at the place that he worked at. So one day he came to my office. And he said, Pastor Dave, I just want to ask you a question. He developed a really good friendship with a married woman. But in their friendship, she had confided that she was very unhappy in her marriage. So I still remember him asking, Pastor Dave, would it be okay if I began to date her? I said, no, it's still not okay. I said, there's a right and there's a wrong, okay? Don't start making excuses and all that. And so I could see that he was beginning to be tempted. He knew he shouldn't do it, but he was having all these arguments. That's the concern that James has as well. Again, it is human nature. When I am tempted, rather than taking responsibility, it is always easier to blame somebody else. Think about, remember when Adam and Eve fell into sin and God came down? Remember what God said, or remember Adam's response to God when he talked about who told you you were naked? He threw two people under the bus. The woman that you gave me. Think about that. The first man confronted with his own sin because he fell into temptation would not take responsibility. He says, the woman that you gave me, she did it. So not only did he blame God for his problem, he also blamed Eve for his problem, and that is human nature. With that in mind, James says, okay, so we've talked about the nature of testing. We've also talked about the nature of God. So now let's talk about my nature. We're going to talk about your nature. So what does James say? 
Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So James says, let's talk about the nature of man. The greatest source of my problem is me. I'm the biggest source of my problem. I remember when I took the church in Rust City. I had inherited some people. One of the guys in particular was a piece of work. I still remember the weekend I candidated. And we were having a meal afterward. This guy, I don't even know who he is yet. I haven't learned all the names. He came up to me. I was kind of up by, I was in the kitchen there. I was getting some food. And he came out to me, and his first, the first thing ever came out of his mouth was, I don't care, whatever you do if you come here, he says, I just want more lively music in church. That was his only concern, I want more live, lively music. Well, I got to know this guy, and he was a piece of work. Uh, uh, he had been saved later in life, and he had really never matured. A couple years into my pastorate, uh, he, was in the, he was a carpenter. And one day he called me up, he says, Pastor Dave, you got to come over to my house. I did something really stupid. And I'm thinking, oh, there were a variety of things that he had done that were really stupid, and I was just trying to think of which this could be. I remember as I drove over to his house, as I pulled up into his yard, he raised the door of his garage. Inside the garage were tools of every kind that any carpenter would love to have. He said, I just bought these. I think they're stolen. <laughs> he said, the guy came by the work site the other day, and he had a really good offer. I was like, and all those tools, and I just could not believe the price he was asking. He says, I did have a thought that maybe they're stolen, but he started to rationalize, well, if I don't buy them, someone else is going to buy them. So I might as well buy them. <laughs> well, after he bought them, he felt convicted. Yeah, they're stolen. What am I going to do? And he says, let's call Sheriff Panati and let's tell him what you did. The point is, he was always doing things like that, just stupid things. He was his own worst problem. And uh, that's what James is getting at as well. James is saying, I, I, I want you to realize where your problems come from. So writing to the people there, your problems do not result of where you're living now. Okay, All the problems you come from within. The reason why James knew that because I think he remembers something that his brother Jesus said. What did Jesus say? This is in Mark chapter 7. For from within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, evil, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Now, have you ever been guilty of saying, well, the devil made me do it? It's a cop-out, according to James, okay? He may have helped you, but he simply tapped into what was already there. So you go back to our uh, thing. If you go back to this, James, uh, in the Greek language, he's using four participles. You may not care what a participle is, but if you know Greek, you've got to know participles. And he uses four participles to describe the process that temptation takes in the person's life. The first two participles are connected to an image you want you to think about, and I love this image. And that is fishing, okay? Fishing is one of my favorite pastimes. I'm bad at it, but I like it, okay? So what does James say? James says that it comes, first of all, you're going to be tempted because of the, you're going to be lured and enticed. And the two words he uses there are the fi an analogy of fishing. For 12 years, uh, a group of us in the church in Rust City would go up to Press Lake in Ontario, Canada. It was my happy week of the year. The third week of July, you knew where I was going to be for 12 years. I was up at Press Lake. There was no cell phone. Uh, thing. No one could bother me. And all we knew was we were going to be catching and eating walleye every single day for the next six days. One year we went up there. We counted that the group of us, there was probably 12 of us, we estimated we ate 90 walleye in a week. Okay. Like I said, I've never had a bad meal in Canada. Never had a bad meal in Canada. And so one of the things we would do before we went up, my youth pastor actually worked at the bait shop in Fish Lake. And so we would get a flat of the fattest night crawlers, 250 night crawlers that you could imagine. And so we'd have this big box and they're just in there crawling around. It was just a beautiful sight. Because you knew 
that the fish are going to find that crawler just so attractive. And so we go out in the water, the fish are minding their own business, and so we began to distract them, okay? We drop that big fat, you know, net crawler down there and just jig around on it. We we're trying to interrupt their normal life so that we could catch them and pull them out of the water. That's the same process that temptation has in our lives as well. Everything comes from within, okay? I see something. It catches my attention. It might be a nicer car, okay? It might, it, it could be a variety of things. The point is, it catches our attention. And what happens? We begin to dwell on it. We begin to think about how it make my life happier, how it make my life more full and all that. The James says the problem is it leads to something else. Once I begin to engage in that, I begin to dwell on it, I'm eventually going to act on it. And that's why Jesus said everything comes from within. All the thoughts, everything I acted on, it started with the thought. And I begin to rationalize it and all that, and it, it, it gets away from me. One of the most memorable passages, I remember as I was writing my commentary on the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 7, it's a fascinating narrative. The father has been having all these long addresses, talking to his son about things that he needs to be aware of. And again, because he's a dad, he knows he's got a typical son, he knows that one of the greatest temptations every young man has is the opposite sex. In James chapter 7, the father tells a story. I want you to listen to the story. In James 7, it says, For at the window of my house, I have looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youth, a young man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. And so the father is trying to get the attention of his kids. He says, I'm going to talk about another young man. It actually could have been a true thing. The father is probably living in a small village, and he's looking out his window at night. He sees a group of young men walking by. He knows that they're kind of idle and they're up to no good. But one young man in particular catches his attention. He's even more ignorant than the rest of them. And there are certain things about this young man that cause his attention. One was the fact that he was keeping company with other young men who didn't have a purpose in life. The other thing that caught their attention was the time of day. It was at night when they were up to no good. And then the third thing that caught their attention was in the neighborhood they were in. There was a woman there that had a reputation and this man was in that neighborhood. And so as the father goes on to describe in very vivid terms, unable to resist her persuasive seduction, the young man suddenly follows her to her house and into her bedroom. And in very descriptive terms, the father described to his own kid what happened. He described that young man as a dumb animal being led to the slaughterhouse. He doesn't even know what's going to happen. Listen to the closing words of this particular thing. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With a smooth talk, she compels him. At once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver, as a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know it'll cost him his life. And that's the warning that James is trying to describe. I'm going to close with a final story, and this is a true story. When I was in college and in seminary, there was also another young man with me. And uh, later on in life, he became a missionary. They served in a particular foreign country. And so in this mission work, um, he and his uh, wife and their children, uh, they, they had, from my perspective, they had a really great ministry. Uh, they led people to the Lord. They started a really good church. Uh, they cared for the social needs of orphans in this particular country. And so they had been in this country for a number of years, and from a, from a distance, it appeared that they just had a dynamic ministry that God had really blessed them. What we did not know was that this missionary was living a double life. The country in which he served was famous for prostitution. And so his wife and their children would be at the compound that day and, you know, caring for the people there and also kind of homeschooling. And so he was all on our own. Every single day, he would drive by. He would drive by, he said, at least 50 prostitutes a day. For the life of me, I do not know why, but one day he stopped simply to talk. I don't know what was going on in his brain, but one day he stopped. And it started just with talking, but eventually it moved on. 
Eventually he was found out. The point is he pulled this off for four years. His wife never knew about it. All the supporting churches he had never knew about it. From, from their perspective, he was just a great missionary to invest in. He came back from the States and his wife found some text on his phone and realized that for four years he had been living this double life. And so he was exposed. He had to leave the ministry. It had a huge impact upon his marriage and all that. I still remember I was in my office one day and the phone rang and it was him. And we began to talk. And again, for the life of me, I could never understand. Uh, I, I would have never imagined him doing that. And so I asked him, how did it happen? And again, again, it simply started one day with simply stopping and talking. But the point is that within his heart, all those sins were there. He simply began to act on it, and it led to destruction. So James' warning to us is that, yes, we're all going to go through trials in life. And when the trials persist, sometimes the temptation is to begin to blame God for the problem and begin to rationalize why you gave in. So James wants to warn us. I want to talk about the nature of trials. The nature of trial, it's to produce a more godly person. That's why God allows trials in your life. But number two, what's the nature of God? It is not God's desire to destroy you. It's God's desire to build you up. And therefore, if you succumb to the trials, you can't blame God. You simply have to look in the mirror. You are your own worst enemy. And so my application would tie into what Scott talked about is make sure that we're taking life seriously. Every single day, get up and make sure that you're taking life seriously. I remember, especially when I was a full-time pastor, every day I got up for my walk, I prayed for myself first because I thought, if God can get me to fall into sin, think about all the damage you can do to people. And I think about this friend of mine who did that. I think about all the lives that he destroyed, people he led to the Lord, and then they saw this happen. And so what James is getting at, take sin seriously. Again, don't blame other people, accept responsibility. And so we need to take that seriously. I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then we will gather around the communion table as we recall the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the great wisdom of James that as he looked at the believers that he was responsible for. He was concerned about how they were handling the trials. He was beginning to hear some rumblings that they were becoming bitter, that they were beginning to blame God for this problem and beginning to rationalize why they were going to do what they were going to do. And so James writes to them, and he reveals to each one of us, even though we may be a child of God, there lurks within us our old nature. In our old nature, the tendency always is, rather than accepting responsibility, is to blame other people. James wants us to realize that there still resides within us a sin nature, which can be activated, can be aggravated, and if we try to rationalize things away, if we don't see the purpose for this trial, we will make bad decisions, and those bad decisions can come with very painful consequences. And so I pray that each one of us will take our Christian life seriously to recognize that your greatest desire for each one of us is to prove the genuineness of our faith, to become steadfast believers who have a long obedience in the same direction, and that is why you allow trials. You're not trying to destroy us. You're actually trying to build us up to make us more godly. And so I pray that we might think about that as we deal with our situations this week. Now be with us as we gather on the communion table. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll ask the serving men to come forward at this time as we gather on the table. I'd just like to read some instructions. I'm going to be reading from the letter that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians. Paul and James have something in common. They were both Orthodox Jews who at one time did not believe in Jesus Christ. James did not believe his older brother. 
And Saul thought that Christianity was a bad religion that needed to be stamped out. And therefore, these two men actually missed the very first communion service. They were not there. Therefore, they did not become believers until after the resurrection. We know that James, shortly thereafter, he became a believer. It wasn't until uh, Saul became him as well. So the apostle Paul now, he's writing about communion. He wants the believers to know why we have communion. And so he had spent some time um, talking to Jesus. And so he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And then he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he come. In the fuller instructions, James or Paul would tell us that before we partake of the Lord's Supper, we need to think about the magnitude of what this means. These elements represent the fact that Jesus died for our sins, and that is the source of our salvation. And therefore, he says, we should not enter into this lightly. And so let's just spend a few moments in quiet, contemplative prayer, asking God to search your heart, to find out where you are spiritually, and to find out if you are ready to partake of these elements. So let's have a quiet word of prayer, and then I'll have a prayer, and then we'll begin to pass out the elements. Our Heavenly Father, we are now gathered around the table. And again, you provided these observations because you know it's human nature that we begin to take these things for granted. We might, they may not be as special. And therefore, the Christian life is never forgetting the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that makes us a child of God. And so I pray, Lord, as we pass out these elements, that we might think about that. And so bless our time as we uh, go through this religious rite. Again, it doesn't make us any closer to you, but it's a reflection of our fellowship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. This time we'll pass out the bread.
again, Jesus tells his disciples, this is my body, which was broken for you. Eat this in memory of me. Now we'll pass out the cup, which represents the blood that was shed for us. Again, Jesus tells his disciples, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So Heavenly Father, help us never to take for granted our salvation, to always cherish the trial that you went through that could actually make us right with the Holy God. And therefore, because you went through a trial, the Christian life is a life of trials. Again, not to destroy us, but to build us up. And so we need to recognize the goodness of God in this. So we thank you for this time of reflection. Pray your blessing as we close now in our final song. In Jesus' name. Closing him is in the red book, which you don't have in front of you. But Lila's very happy to put the words on the screen for us.
don't know if you've ever sung this little Sunday school song that my wife was telling me about this week. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little God, what you say. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little hands, what you do. Thank you, Father, for looking down from above in your love. Praise the Savior, you who know him. Amen.